Okay. Awesome. Well, good morning or good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, it is an absolute honor to be here today uh, moderating today's amazing panel. Uh, today's panel is uh, Equity and Outcomes in Criminal Justice. Uh, just wanted to uh, kick us off with the introduction of myself, and then I'll pass the mic to our panelists to give a brief uh, introduction of themselves. Um, I'll start off, uh, Derek Brown, Senior Director of the Leo T. McCarthy Center at the great University of San Francisco. Um, also a native born and raised here in San Francisco. Uh, prior to my time here at USF, I served as senior advisor to the last three mayors of San Francisco um, and also a senior advisor to the chief of police and liaison to the mayor's office. Uh, for myself here at the center, we prepare students for a successful life in public service. And it's also a labor of love for me to do the work that I'm doing. Uh, that being said, I would love to pass the mic to uh, Amanda Knapp. If you could please just give us a brief intro of yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am an employee at FIU with the Furry Institute for Civic Leadership. I'm also a first year public affairs PhD student with my background research in human trafficking. I also uh, completed my master's in international intercultural education where I focused my research on human trafficking in Latin America. Great, thanks so much, Amanda. Um, also, before I pass the mic to the next panelist, I wanna give a huge shout out uh, to one of my co-chairs, uh, Aaron Rollins. He's in the house. So I don't know if you wanna just say hello to everyone, if you're around Aaron. Hello, how are you all? I'm uh, over here working on my presentation for tomorrow. So <laughs> I am happy to be here, so uh, thanks as well. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Really appreciate that. Uh, next up, I would love to pass the mic to Claire to give a brief introduction of herself. Hi, thank you. My name is Claire Knox. I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Administration at the University of Central Florida. And I was the founding director of our Masters of Emergency and Crisis Management program, which is ranked number three in the nation. And I'm very excited to be here with you today. Awesome, Claire. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, did Jason make it? Is he is he on yet? No, unfortunately, he's double booked today, and so I'm taking the lead. Okay, well, sounds good. Look forward to diving in. Uh, next up, I would love to pass the mic to Alexandra. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'm a PhD student. My name is Alexandra. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, FIU, Florida International University in uh, International Crime and Justice, as well as a graduate assistant with the Frey Institute as well, uh, where I work with Amanda. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for the incredible introduction. Uh, next up, I would love to go with Sheila. Did she make it on yet? Yes, not, okay. So we were waiting for her. So she'll be here shortly. Um, again, I, I really, really wanna thank everyone for coming out today. We are absolutely in for a treat. Uh, really looking forward to this amazing conversation. Uh, the flow of the day, uh, what we're gonna do is we, we just did the introductions. Uh, then we're gonna go to our panelists, uh, give them about seven to nine minutes to uh, talk a little bit about some of the amazing work they're doing and the impact that they have had and at their institution. Um, and after everyone has that opportunity, we'll open it up for Q&A um, and dive into that. And then in the end, we'll just kind of wrap up with uh, final thoughts. So without further ado, um, I would love to pass the mic to Alexandra uh, to present to us all. Great, and I will start uh, sharing my screen. Let's see. Okay, hopefully you can all see this. So I'll be uh, presenting on uh, indigenous experiences in the criminal justice system uh, between 2012 and 2020 uh, as a sort of more uh, understudied area of uh, studies into race and criminal justice. Um, 
uh, indigenous populations uh, have been researched and, and there have been important findings, um, but it is a comparatively small amount of research. Uh, some important studies have uh, found that violence against Native Americans um, is most often due to uh, interracial crimes rather than intraracial. Um, on reservations, tribal law enforcement uh, typically lack both jurisdiction and resources to charge and prosecute non-natives. Uh, and therefore, um, a lot of these offenders go unapprehended. Uh, there are more uh, indigenous um, uh, full heritage indigenous victims on uh, reservations. And so that especially impacts them. There's also been uh, research into uh, widespread underreporting due to shame associated with certain types of crime, a fear of retaliation from uh, offenders or law enforcement, as well as skepticism that non-native police can effectively uh, administer justice in these cases. Uh, the CDC actually reports that uh, Indigenous victims have the highest rate of uh, police-related fatalities, 12% uh, higher than those of Black individuals and three times higher than for white individuals. Hmm. Okay. Uh, it's important to note that this group is not a monolith and uh, their experiences with criminal justice may be complex based on a number of factors, including age, uh, gender, their racial identity. Um, studies have also pointed to that uh, indigeneity and whiteness can be complicated issues for multiracial American Indians. Um, in a 2015 survey from the Pew Research Center, they found that white American Indians uh, actually constituted the largest percentage of multiracial individuals in the US. Um, and 61% of them identified as white, uh, whereas 22% identified as having more in common with their American Indian ancestors. Um, they also found that black American Indians reported the most discrimination of any multiracial group, uh, which included from the public, private businesses, uh, as well as from law enforcement. So the present study uh, seeks to further our understanding of these uh, issues by assessing how arrest outcomes uh, were distributed among um, American in Indian or Alaska Native uh, descent uh, between 2012 and 2020. So individual level data from the uh, National Crime Victimization Survey, the NCBS, um, we use the incident record type file uh, to assess the relationship between uh, certain explanatory variables and uh, the results in arrest outcomes. Cases were selected, uh, whether they fit the criteria of um, a victim of indigenous descent who had experienced a crime in the last six months. Um, and then obviously uh, cases with missing data were eliminated and this left us with a sample of 2,621 individuals. So our dependent variable of arrest outcome had four distinct possibilities. Our reference category uh, was uh, whether the crime had been reported and an arrest or charges had been effectuated. Uh, this was understood to mean uh, that justice had been served. The um, other distinct possibilities were that the uh, crime was reported, but uh, there was no arrest or charges made. Uh, the crime was reported, but the victim did not know the outcome at the time of their interview, or that the victim never reported the incidents. Uh, the independent variables we included in, uh, had our covariates of the victim's age, gender, and whether the crime was committed on an Indian reservation. And our variable of interest uh, was racial identity. For our reference category there, um, we looked at uh, American Indian, Alaska Natives of full descent and compared with uh, the other five multiracial indigenous groups that appeared in the sample, including white American Indians, black American Indians, white black American Indians, Asian American Indians, and white Asian American Indians. So we uh, performed a multinomial logistic regression to test whether uh, racial identity was predictive of arrest outcomes uh, while controlling for the victim's age, gender, and uh, whether the crime was on an uh, Indian reservation. And we produced odds ratios uh, to indicate the change in probability um, of the dependent variable based on the regression coefficients. Uh, the uh, level of significance was determined at the 0.05 level. So our case processing summary for the entire sample uh, during this time, comparing indigenous victims with non-indigenous um, 
produced similar trends uh, in terms of how the outcomes were distributed among the populations, uh, but we did notice uh, that crime reporting was 5% lower for Indigenous American victims uh, at 32% versus 37% for non-Indigenous. Our regression uh, is a little complex uh, to interpret, but basically we found that on the issue of crime reporting, uh, indigenous victims of full heritage were less likely than several multiracial groups uh, to report crime, but it, this was only significant when compared with the group of Asian American Indians. Um, here we found that uh, indigenous victims of full descent were 86% more likely than uh, this multiracial group to have reported the crime. Uh, sorry, to have never reported the crime than to have received justice uh, for the incident. We also found that if they did report crime, uh, indigenous victims of full heritage were 92% less likely than Asian American Indians and 63% less likely than white Black American Indians to have their perpetrators be arrested or charged. And finally, uh, age was highly uh, significant in predicting whether the victim knew the fate of their perpetrators. Uh, so for a one-year increase in age, victims of American Indian descent who reported their crimes uh, were roughly 3% less likely to know the arrest outcome versus having the arrest effectuated. So in exploring indigenous victims experiences with criminal justice, we found that race and age were predictive uh, significantly. Um, American Indians or Alaska Natives of full heritage uh, were significantly less likely than certain multiracial uh, indigenous groups to report crime and or uh, have their perpetrators held accountable. Older individuals from this population were significantly less likely to know the arrest outcome, indicating greater disenfranchisement from the criminal justice process. Uh, we have some limitations with our study, um, which I might be running out of time, but basically they have to do with uh, a representative sample, some limitations of the NCVS and how they collect data. Um, and we, in a future study, may want to explore uh, other variables. These were limited to um, uh, those having to do with the victim, whereas uh, the race of the offender could be uh, yield some interesting results uh, as well. But our findings are consistent with past studies on underreporting among Native American victims. Uh, it also expands our understanding of justice outcomes within this diverse uh, community and, and future research is definitely needed. If similar trends are to be observed, um, they can inform uh, really important policy directions, including increased jurisdictional empowerment for tribal law enforcement, which is uh, definitely an effort that is ongoing uh, in the indigenous community. And this might look like uh, cross deputization agreements with state police, um, as well as improvements to targeted outreach and victim services uh, as part of the broader effort to advance social equity for indigenous people in the criminal justice system. So thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Awesome, Alexandra, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that incredible presentation. And I know we all have a couple questions for you, but we're gonna save them to the end. So thanks again. Uh, mm -hmm. Next up, I would love to pass the mic to Amanda Knapp to give her presentation. Awesome, let me share my screen. Okay. All right, hi everyone. Um, so my topic is on cultural barriers within the law enforcement regarding human trafficking, victims identification and conviction rates. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, my project started in this past spring where I conducted the literature review. And then um, in our program, we have to conduct a summer which goes into the fall research paper. Um, and that's what I'll be doing um, interviews. Um, I'll explain a little bit. So it's a two part program. So I have the lit review completed and I started the summer um, paper research. Um, but the two police departments I will be investigating and we'll talk about is um, the Miami Beach Police Department and St. Petersburg. Um, so some background information about human trafficking. Um, it is an ongoing human rights and public health issue that does affect all genders, races, socioeconomical classes, sexual orientations. It doesn't discriminate. 
Um, it touches all human entities. Um, and that's why it's so important in a global issue, but also a United States issue. Currently, it's estimated that over 24 million people are trafficked worldwide. And within the United States, they estimate about 16,000 um, per year due to uh, victims calling the hotlines and um, nonprofit organizations. In 2000, the United States passed the first federal law, Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and then all 50 states followed with anti-trafficking legislation. But at the same time, victim identification remains low here in the United States. For example, in 2020, there was only 570 federal cases tried. Um, so that shows while we have believed over 16,000 cases, the capacity of law enforcement um, and my argument of low victim identification, we don't try many cases. Um, and my recommendations through the lit literature review and through my summer research will be based on Kurt Lewin's theory of 1947 of organizational change and scientific management. So to dive into the project, which started with the literature review, um, I, I got this idea from the lack of public perception within my family and friends. Um, as well as my department at FIU. So I did research on the waves um, defined by Farrell and Fay in 2009. They defined the mainstream media waves into three groups. When human trafficking um, was defined in the 1990s as human rights um, issues because of what was happening in Europe with white women, Eastern European, and that's when, at the same time, human smuggling was interchangeable with the definition of human trafficking. So you can see from the beginning the problem with the definition, because from the beginning, Americans believed that human trafficking had to cross international borders, and most of the time was perceived as sex trafficking with women and children. Um, so that's where I think the beginning of the policy problem started. And then you see a little bit of a change through 2000 and 2002, um, when I just mentioned the TVPA uh, was um, federally created and the perception changed, but then 9-11 happened. And then human trafficking became a human, uh, instead of a human rights issue, issue, a national security issue. And then strengthened on that after Bush, um, and the, the creation of Homeland Security and national security, then um, immigration became a national security issue in the United States. So that's really where um, my basis comes from because unfortunately these different waves created ambiguity um, within the United States, within our public, within our police, within our judicial system. So that was the first part of the literature review. Um, and then I really dug deep. Um, I looked at the public perception of Americans. Um, there, are, there are not a lot of studies, but there are some that did do um, interviews, surveys, and they did find that up until this day that most Americans believe trafficking only invo involves girls and women and is sex. Most Americans don't even understand or have been informed on the labor aspect when really labor accounts for 40% of this problem here in the United States. Um, and unfortunately, the mass media doesn't help this cause um, because at least in, in Miami, what I see in the news is sex trafficking, sex busts. You don't ever hear of the labor trafficking aspect. And unfortunately, as I'm saying, there's insufficient um, empirical data on the, on the American perspective of trafficking policy. And then I dove um, deep uh, in the criminal justice field. There is a lot of information um, on law enforcement and their, percep their perception of trafficking. Um, and unfortunately, what studies show is that police, due to a lack of education on human trafficking in their departments. They do hold biases. They do 
unfortunately label victims as perpetrators. Um, and they do have cultural blinders that we see throughout the United States with racism and sexism that really hinder them being able to identify a victim. And then with the literature review, I looked at change management theory and really about the high profile law enforcement cases that show change must occur. Um, and this again um, comes, comes from Lewin who says motivation has to come within. So until the police force understand that they do have a perception problem with traffic victims, I don't see the victim identification number growing. Um, so that moves into what I've been working on in the summer, um, defining the cultural barriers, which will be the theory to my paper. Um, and this is right now where I'm at is the top three, lack of female representation, only 13% of law enforcement are female. Um, also the themes of boys clubs, hostile work environment, sexism, discrimination in the workplace. And until there are more women, why would a victim who at times a majority is a woman, why would they want to trust a police officer when they've been being abused or held against their will? Um, so that's the first cultural barrier. The second is the Anglo-American masculinity values that we all know from research exists. Um, that in the 1960s and 1970s, the authoritarian military style that came from the drug wars, um, this again has the male police officers who aren't educated on trafficking victims that they have they have they have a uh, they have a barrier that helps them identify victims as opposed to let's say prostitutes or illegal workers or migrants, um, and then we can see uh, the the recent murders of police using violence, which both of those of female and male roll into the education that most law enforcement um, for entry level positions do not require a college degree. And unfortunately, our law enforcement do not have in general knowledge that a college degree would give them. That research shows that a law enforcement who have been educated on different levels, they're less likely to use force. So these cultural barriers all go together with the victim identification, whether it's a metropolitan city like Miami Beach or a rural city in, let's say, Nebraska until there's massive organizational change, the human traffic victims are gonna have um, problems being identified. Um, so the theories and the next steps are, I'm going to keep working on the cultural barriers um, because these barriers inhibit law enforcement um, from identifying the victims as opposed to criminals. I want to look at the lack of women and compare that um, with the two cities I'm researching. Um, definitely look at how the cultural barriers affect the victim's trust and their emotional state. Possibly look at maybe it's not police who should be the first to make this relationship with the victim, but maybe a social services worker. Um, so it's going to be interesting when I do speak to the police um, and then the cultural barrier of organizational change. So hopefully um, through the interviews, I've already spoken with both departments, both are um, on board, both are very willing to speak with me, but a little, the reason I've picked both of these cities in South Florida where I live um, in Miami Beach um, but St. Petersburg popped out during my research because they received a federal grant in 2020 mm -hmm. where they have established a very effective, um, due to the data I can see, an effective human trafficking task force where they collaborate with other agencies, nonprofits, um, and attorneys, and they proactively reach out to their victims. Whereas opposed in my home city, um, which most people know Miami Beach is a very touristic metropolitan wealthy city and we have no type of task force um, we do have a human trafficking unit 
but there is no collaboration, um, no uh, proactive go to the streets. Um, so I think that will help this study understand while Miami Beach is a very large and progressive city and many things like the environment, they lack the collaboration of the community to identify these victims and criminals, whereas opposed to St. Petersburg is going out the streets with backpacks to talk to these victims to establish that relationship so they don't bombard them and scare them and lose their trust. So the goal, which I've spoken to both police chiefs, is interview 10 officers from each force that do work with human trafficking, but I also hope to work with officers who don't have that background in human trafficking. Um, I hope to gain their knowledge and their perspective, their perspectives and perceptions, and then also determine in each city their victim identification and the arrest due to human trafficking. So that is my project and it's a lot, but I really hope it does help South Florida in the future in some way. That's amazing. Thanks so much, Amanda. I know I have a, a bunch of questions pertaining to like the community engagement and some of those efforts. So hopefully we have some time to dive into that um, after all of the presentations. So thank you so much, Amanda. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we move to our, our next panelist, I uh, just wanted to give another shout out to one of our uh, co-chairs, uh, Richard Correa. Uh, I don't know if you wanna say hello to everyone. He's probably tied up, but we come back to him later. Uh, but hey, Rich. Uh, so next up, I would love to pass the mic to Claire. Uh, we would love to hear your perspective, uh, whether it's a presentation, are you, uh, addressing some of the amazing work that you're doing. So, uh, oh, there you are, you got your presentation ready. Thanks, Claire. Yes. yes, absolutely, thank you. And again, we are so honored to be presenting in this format. And um, I'm presenting on behalf of my co-author, Jason Rivera. This paper is currently under review right now, but we are very welcome to any feedback or um, uh, that you might have. And so we are um, focused on how do we define social equity and emergency management, since right now there is lacking a definition. So scholars have argued that the concept of social equity remains subjective. While the vagueness of the concept provides fertile grounds for intellectual debate, failing to arrive at a single formal definition can lead to confusion an inability to measure it as a programmatic or policy goal and it can lead to incremental and short term solutions also coined as muddling through by Lynn Bloom. So we'll start by understanding this concept in the broader public administration literature. Waldo and Fredrickson argue that social equity has been used as a criteria for effectiveness in public administration, similar to the other concepts of efficiency and productivity. However, to use the concept as an indicator of effectiveness, one must operationalize it and define it so we can actually adequately assess the progress toward and the achievement of socially equitable practices, policies, and programs. Scholars indicate that there is a wide variety of the operationalization of social equity, which typically focuses in on fairness, although there is an emphasis on different levels of redistributive justice to account for historical and uh, continuing in equity practices that we see even today. However, Gooden and Portilio maintain that these social categories, which we tend to find in representative bureaucracy literatures, are simplistic in their description. Other characteristics such as age, sexual orientation, abilities, intersect to encompass one's more holistic categorical identity. And so what we see here at the bottom of the of the slide here is the definition from the National Academy of Public Administration, which emphasizes Rawls notion of fairness and justice. Despite the absence of directly mentioning, sorry, beside the act, the absence of direct mentioning of race and ethnicity, gender or income, this definition from Napa, at least in rhetoric if not an actual practice, is focused on particular social dimensions. 
While the larger public administration discipline identified social equity as a concern in the 1960s, it was not until the 1980s that the disaster and emergency management scholars engaged in this concept, but they did so from a lens of social vulnerability. These first wave of scholars challenged the homogeneous grouping of disaster victims and considered some of the underlying factors in impacting their vulnerability. Drawing on Marxism, Sussman and co-authors provided the first definition of vulnerability that is seen here. The 1990s saw a second wave of scholars expand this definition of vulnerability to include the macro, meso, and uh, micro levels of political and economic processes that we see impacting individuals and groups during a disaster. Since then, scholars have made significant strides in defining, measuring, and mapping social vulnerability in the United States and abroad. However, Dr. Rivera and I argue social vulnerability is not social equity. And by leaning on social vulnerability instead of actually coming up with the definition of social equity, we find that organizations that are attempting to calculate social equity using social vulnerability data, they're not accounting for the underlying systemic issues in which many of the response recovery and mitigation programs are operating and are based on. So as a means of understanding how scholars have and continue to define social equity or trying to define social equity in emergency management, we conducted a, a systematic literature review for social equity in high ranking emergency management academic journals that you see on the list here. We looked from January 2006 until December 2021, and we selected 2006 because we know Katrina happened in August of 2005, which really changed and opened up that conversation about social equity and emergency management, unlike any other disaster had before. So our initial query produced 76 results. You heard me right. 76 articles on social equity in our top emergency management journals almost 20 years. We filtered out those that included book reviews and uh, symposium introductions, and it left us with 68 peer-reviewed journal or articles. Um, then Dr. Rivera and I, we coded over four weeks with a framework analysis built on some of the literature from public administration as well as public health and uh, what we saw in emergency management. And some of our dominant themes included indicators, definitions, geographic context, and how social equity was discussed in relation to social equity. There are a few striking characteristics from the sample that we drew. First was the mentioning of social equity remain low between 2006 and 2015. We saw a slow increase in 2016, and it's, it should be noted that about 50% of the articles public were, have been published in the last two years. So this is a conversation that while we've been talking, we've been trying to talk about it, we actually haven't. Um, of, uh, of the 52% uh, of the articles, over half of the articles were geographically placed outside the United States. It's interesting to note. Um, only five of the articles actually offer a definition of social equity within the context of their study, and only nine provide indicators for that concept. And then although all the articles mention the phrase social equity at least once, only 23 of the 68 articles mentioned the phrase two or more times. And so what we see here are for those articles that are situated inside the United States, we see that the emphasis is on procedural, recognitional, and distributive equity. And it's the focus on the social economic dynamics and the ability of populations. Articles without a geographic concept emphasize inclusion with throughout the emergency management cycle, diversification of skills and knowledge of personnel and equity of access. And the focus was on social economic uh, dynamics, gender and, and ethnicity, culture and faith of the populations. And then again, 50% of the articles that were set outside the United States context had an emphasis on the quality of access, reducing social vulnerability um, of populations equalizing impacts of hazards, equalizing the relative benefits of these various programs and interventions. And the focus on, was on race, ethnicity, gender, elderly, language barriers, and socioeconomic status of the populations. So what do we do with this? Well, Dr. Jason Rivera and I decided to, oh, sorry, sorry, what happened? Okay, uh, come up with a proposed definition, because again, there is no definition in our 
fields of emergency management, including uh, FEMA, which is that's their big focus right now, is on social equity, but yet they haven't defined it. So we throw out this definition. It's the active, culturally competent, and equal provision of services to every social group across all phases of emergency management and the continuing reduction of all group social vulnerability that contributes to disparate physical and social damages associated with natural, technical, and non tech hazards. How do we measure this? So again, scouring all the literature, we came up with six different categories or dimensions of social equity. And again, this is pulling from a very rich literature coming out of public health, public administration policy. And what we're arguing is that we can actually try to measure this. So the first definition that you see, the social equity dimension, each of these dimensions can have an unlimited amount of indicators to measure procedural fairness or access or quality of service. The idea is that these uh, equations can be attributed to at the individual, the program, or the organizational level. So you can have the ability to include as many indicators for each of these six different dimensions, but we're going to weigh them to a total score of 10 because we know that some of these outcomes are going to, some of these uh, indicators, um, sorry, so some of these dimensions are going to have more indicators than others. So we want to make sure we're measuring apples to apples. And then the second equation gives you the total social equity score for that individual, that program, or that organization. And the idea is that those six different dimensions weighted out at 10 could give you a possible total score of 60. And so depending if you have a 40 out of 60 or, or 50 out of 60, you can then be able to measure your, uh, the, the social equity. And so in conclusion, while public administration and emergency management has been fascinated with the concept of social equity for decades and hence this conference, both fields have failed to adopt and apply a standard definition. And this has led to inconsistencies on how we measure the presence of social equity. And so we're going to continue to not have uh, reach social equity programs or policies or procedures. We synthesize the social equity definition for emergency management and suggest a way to measure it along six different dimensions or indicate with it, many indicators. Of course, we have limitations and we have future research considerations, but I will pause here um, and am happy to take any questions. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Claire. This was, like I say, each and every presentation was uh, riveting. Uh, I know I have a bunch of questions to ask you all. Uh, definitely wanted to pause to see if any folks uh, would like to share any questions. Uh, you can post your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can unmute you so you can personally ask that question. Um, before we go to the chat or, or folks raise their hand, I know I have one question uh, that I would love to pose to you all. Um, first and foremost, the work that you have been doing is extraordinary. And with all the work that you've been doing in the field pertaining to social justice and criminal justice space, like, is there anything that still surprises you about the work you're doing and some of the things you have found and why? Well, I can go first. Okay. Um, <laughs> One thing that still surprises me is the pushback in academia. Um, in, in my department, I won't name names, but um, when I bring up the topic, um, sometimes um, it seems that they don't think it's a problem or they think it's only a sex problem. And they also, it seems from their attitudes that I, I'm wasting my time. Um, so it, that's been hard for me, um, that professors and academia um, are supposed to be supportive of their students. And I've, I've had a lot of pushback. Um, so that's something that's been surprising. And, and thank you for sharing that. Really appreciate that, Amanda. And, and, and how does that make you feel? It's made me cry at times. <laughs> because um, you get, come up with this amazing topic, you put time into the you know, background, and then you have your professor say, oh, well, they, they, they got into the field. They, so how can you argue they don't wanna be there? Or 
another professor say, well, it's just sex trafficking. Um, but I do have so, a very supportive um, professors, but sometimes you have to take a class that you have, you have to, um, and I'm dedicated and passionate about my topic and I'm not gonna, you know, let anyone stop, but it, it's, it's a struggle sometimes. Absolutely, man. No, thank you so much for sharing. And, and I definitely feel the same way about the work that I've been doing, you know, for decades and, and focusing on community, uplifting community, social justice. And, you know, for years, it has been tough to make some headway um, until recently. And now, you know, folks are starting to come to the table. And I'm like, I've been here for decades. This is what I've been trying to say for so long. So uh, definitely want to encourage you to continue to push, continue to fight, continue to fight for what you believe in, Amanda. And I know, like I say, job well done thus far. Um, and let's just keep it up. Definitely. Sure. Um, if I could answer yes. your question as well. Um, so that was a great question. Thank you very much for asking it. You know, serendipitously, I'm also currently at the FEMA Higher Education yeah. Symposium. And yeah. this is a conversation that we were literally having this morning. Did you and see that? Oh, uh, what, what's interesting what is that, you know, I, I guess part of it is as a formal practitioner is the frustration that we're still having this conversation. We're still talking about it. We still have yet to define it. We've still yet to come up with measurements and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to like, Amanda, I'm not going to call out people, but I do have people I know with FEMA who say they're not going to define it because that means that they didn't have to put a budget. They didn't have to come up with uh, you, learning outcomes. They have to come you know up with all these I, different I, I'm things glad you did. You know why? that is going to um, make sure this is on mute. That's going to make sure that, you know, it, it's just going to make it hard uh, and it's going to keep them from reaching any type of program or policy goal. And, um, you know, again, I, I'm not, I'm speaking to the crowd when it comes to saying that we've been doing this for way too long. And yet we still, I feel like we're still not making the progress we should be. And so I feel like we're, and many times we're just talking the talk, or at least they are. Um, and, and we need to start walking and measuring and getting, moving forward. So thank you for the question. Amen to that, Claire. No, I appreciate you sharing that as well. Uh, sentiments is the same with, I'm sure everyone on this call, um, action speaks louder than words. So Claire, really appreciate that. Thank you. I think uh, also if I could jump in, like going off of that, uh, you know, sort of like barriers to uh, studying issues that definitely warrant attention. Uh, my biggest sort of surprise thus far, and I'm still a early career academic, um, but just how much opportunity there is in um, different research topics, even in the area that has received more attention. There's, you know, just given the changing landscape of our political environment, uh, various other things, there's just anything that you're interested in and passionate about and think, you know, warrants attention, um, just go for it. Cause there's so many different ways to look at uh, different topics and um, explore sort of avenues that in a new and innovative way. That's amazing, Alexander. No, thank you so much, and, and really appreciate um, your your candid answers as well, and 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 keeping it real. And uh, I love real talk, and 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 just really being honest about the work that we're doing because I think the work that we're doing is, is transformational. Um, and more folks that we can bring into the tent to help us, and we can all work together uh, to uplift this work. And one of the things that I believe in, and I and I say often is teamwork makes the dream work and together collectively we could do some amazing work so again i know we have a few more questions uh definitely want to pass the mic to jim to ask your question thanks jim thank you um i'm actually going to add more of a comment as i'm looking at amanda okay. and by background i retired after uh, 30 years with the city my last 10 years was as a crime and intelligence analyst and certainly human trafficking was on my radar maybe we see things differently in california it's just human trafficking um again i'm lapd and you can't believe how many homicides my guys worked that were tied to human trafficking. So please send that back to your professors from me that the uh, there's at least one LAPD 
employee who is outraged by that because I've seen too many bodies. So I'll just kind of leave it there. The other thing, um, and Claire and I were in Jacksonville. Um, I have to admit, Florida is not my wife's favorite place for a few reasons, Ron DeSantis being one. But um, it is amazing that all my colleagues were telling me how they are being precluded from discussing this. Fortunately, that's not happening out here. No one's passing laws to prevent us from discussing these topics. And it brings me to the question of, forgive my language, what the hell are they afraid of? So you can tell I'm a practitioner, not an academic. All right, I'll leave it there. I love it, Jim. No, I, I appreciate your candor and, and you're telling it how it is. And uh, definitely appreciate your comments, your thoughts, uh, your insight, um, and, and really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Can, can, can I interrupt real quick? Uh, I, uh, Jim, uh, uh, I have to say you're right on point. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an old New Yorker. I'm a researcher. I'm in the private sector. I'm also in the public sector mm -hmm. uh, with ASPA. I'm a lifetime member since 1980. Uh, I, I, part of my family is Native American, uh, but I don't flaunt it. I don't want no money from it, you know? Uh, but the thing is, I'm trying to say here today is, is that, uh, you need to read an article that came out and I'm in the Dallas area right now. And you need to read the article because they busted, uh, for child, child trafficking, uh, down by the border, like a week ago, like 20 kids they found. And, and regardless of how you, you look at it, this is old news. I, and I'm not being pessimistic, I'm being optimistic. The only problem with my pessimism is that, like Jim said, he worked it. And, uh, and, and that has been a problem that truly has not been addressed. And it's done because policy has not been set or enforced to, 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 to actually open it. And one thing, I hate to say this, man, there's too much money. So you, you, you have to look at the crux of the problem. And for me, uh, my research is in affordable housing. <laughs> and that's a nasty, nasty situation. And it deals with not only uh, uh, affordable housing for, for minorities or women, but it deals with also crime, you know, and, and money plays a big part in it. And what has to be done for me is, is that when I look into that, we have to make sure we put the right people in place that are responsible to the people. And, and when I'm saying that law enforcement, uh, hey, uh, I have problems with law enforcement, but hey, I have people who, who, who were commanders in New York, who, you know, who were, uh, you know, um, assistant district attorneys in New York who are family. Okay, so, but, but my, my point is not to tie anybody up and waste a lot of time, is that I, 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 I want to say uh, uh, to uh, Amanda Cap, hey, academics should say, hey guys, you're free to express the constitutional First Amendment and allowing us to express what is happening to us. Uh, I had the same problem during my dissertation in affordable housing because again, it's a nasty issue because there's a lot of things in there that, that policy states and, and doesn't follow through. They hide it. Uh, so, you know, as a practitioner like Jim Grant, because I'm a acquisition funding, uh, you know, consultant, uh, and I help develop business or, or, or projects that uh, for affordable housing, you know, casinos, hotels, and the rest of that stuff, and for nonprofit organizations. But my issue is that never give that, 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 that goal up because it's an old issue. There's a lot of things tied into it. And, and you gotta, 
so long you present the facts right, you know, don't be afraid to do that. And that's all I have to say, people. Awesome, Edward. No, I, I appreciate uh, your thoughts, your comments, and, and like, I'm, I'm catching a theme. Everyone's keeping it real and being open and honest, and I love it. I, I absolutely appreciate this conversation. Um, I know before we go to Lisa, she has a question. I wanted to ask the panelists if you guys had any any other comments before we go to the next uh, question. We good? Awesome. Well, well said, Edward. Thank you so much. And next up, I'd love to pass the mic to Lisa. Uh, you're on mute, Lisa. Just wanted to say thank you for the insight. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the transparency. I want to share something quick so that I can jump off. I'm presently walking through a Black clinician uh, that was a dentist that was arrested just here recently with the Oxnard Police Department. Can't go in through all the specifics. Broke her wrist. We're walking through the disenfranchised laws. Prior to that, she had to deal with a sexual assault that was never even identified. The perpetrator walked right out of the office. She's thrown into jail. We're walking through that process now. And what I say in regards to just, we can talk, 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 but there are people that need our assistance in advocacy and dealing with disenfranchised laws, uh, finding out ways to do it because we can write papers all day long, but people are at the point of bursting. Um, me, myself, having to walk through being a triple minority, I stand as an Afro-Latina, doing advocacy and understanding gender issues and being able to advocate for people that, one, don't have the technology to sit on this kind of conference, two, they're not allowed to speak, and they don't have the accessibility, nor the navigation, nor the savviness to be able to acquire the assistance of all these wonderful panelists. Um, I think uh, good, uh, I'm very grateful for the gentleman that uh, said, yeah, what the heck is going on? because we're done with the formats. We're literally having to fight the Oxnard Police Department by ourselves because everyone is fearful to take on the challenge. So how many George Floyds, how many shootings? There are people in the grassroots that they want the positions to be advocates, but the doors are not open. Who can give them the doors to open it? We can. And so when I say that, I have our clinician that's on now dealing with what she's dealing with. And the only reason that she was able to fight back is that they found out later she was a black dentist. So walking through it as I speak to you. So these forms are powerful in submitting and changing. But as uh, the previous uh, doctor said, we're done with the data. We're done with all the collections. We're done with all move. Uh, like we say in Spanish, fuego a la lata, put some fire underneath the can and get some things cracking because we're done with talking. We need movement and because people are dying. And even in regards to sexual trafficking, I'm going to say this and pop off, is sexual trafficking started in the 1600s when slaves were in the bottom of ships. Yeah. So we've had this problem with sexual uh, 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 abuse with women, children for generations. We only want to talk about African-Americans and Native Americans and what's going on. So we need to be inclusive of everyone's story and how they've moved through the process of liberation and how we move the needle of criminal justice. And the only way that we're going to be able to do this is that you have to go into the grassroots and get the advocates as they did in Harlem and the advocates in Mississippi and, and the advocates in Miami and the advocates who do not I have educations, but can tell you a life story and walk you through power and wisdom. This is how we'll change social equity. You have to open the doors to allow people that do not have the education, they do not have a forum to speak to allow to become in. Because we're hearing from a lot of professors. But when you go through a life experience, you know exactly what it is to be thrown in jail. Be hungry, get out, and still not be able to climb up because social equity door is not open to you. Thank you for allowing me to share. Mm. Lisa, amen to that. Preach. Appreciate that. I swear we should change the title of, of this conversation to Real Talk. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, definitely. I, I don't know about you, but I'm fired up and I'm pumped up and ready to continue to go. Um, I know I saw Elizabeth. She unmuted herself. Elizabeth, did you have a question? Uh, no. Oh, OK. But thank you. OK. Uh no, I'd just like to say one thing. Uh, I'm glad to with Lisa from Gense. Um, uh, also, a part of my family is Latin. I'm very, my family is very mixed. But the, what, what I want to say is that don't forget uh, when you write about the sex trafficking of women and children, don't forget there's men in that who also have been raped and, and yeah. done things. Uh, 
And I have to tell you from experience about that part, uh, about men being raped. And, and when a man that sits down, when a woman says, hey, I, I understand your pain, you may think he's fooling, but if he really understands your pain, you should understand that he's for real. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. No, I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, but before we go to the, the next question, just wanted to pause and see if any of our panelists has any thoughts, feedback, comments, anything that they would like to share. No, just like you uh, mentioned, just appreciate the candor and it's, you know, so true and it absolutely should be firing us all up, you know, as we leave this panel. Absolutely. And, and that being said, I know doing this work, I mean, it's tough. Like it, it is tough. We're, we're doing it nonstop. We're, we're, we're trying to bring, you know, folks under the tent. Uh, we've been doing this for so long. Uh, and to, to our panelists, um, what inspires you? to keep going. Um, I'll, oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in. So um, for me and uh, social justice uh, and social equity goes back to being um, in Southern Louisiana with um, environmental justice issues and, and working in communities um, and, and um, on Cancer Alley um, and what keeps me going is that we still have so much work to do um, and that um, it, it needs to be better. We need to strip, for emergency management, I firmly believe we need to strip down every single program that we have, look at the rafters, look behind the dust boards and actually rethink, is this the most, is this the best way we can do it? And, and to rebuild emergency management. Claire, I wanna say thank you so much. And, and know what, we were so pumped up and having such a great time. Looks like we only have 76 seconds left. So before we end, I just really want to thank each and every one of you for joining us this panel. Uh, thank again, all of our panelists. You were superb. Um, I just want to pass the mic to you. 10 seconds. Any final thoughts, final words? Let's start with Alexandra. Sure. I think just the urgency of this moment where we see civil liberties under threat, uh, it, it just really should be compelling all of us to, to do what we can in the various sectors that we work in. Thank you so much, Amanda. Yeah, um, I'll never give up. Um, I am very active in Miami Beach. I'm on our human rights committee. Um, while this is just an academic conference, I know most of us in our own lives are doing things to better social equity and our communities and fight for what we're going through this turbulence right now. Um, and especially on my academic end with human trafficking, I will continue to fight. Um, and I know it, as I said in the beginning, it's women, children, boys, girls, gay, lesbian, black, white, it, it's, it's for all of us. And that's what we need to keep doing academic. Dr. Harris, was this the same doctor, the, the one same who one? came into our yep. Yep. She blew my mind. Like, yeah, she's yeah. So that was yeah. one of the best lectures. It was so yeah. good. She's she, incredible. Tifa, what's up? What's up, sis? Hey. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. <laughs> good. All the USF people. Oh, oh, good, Dr. Harris. You heard that. So. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dr. Hi, Dr. Harris. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Dr. So Harris, much. didn't that that Thank that you. uh you know, make you feel 10, ten steps higher? <laughs> yes, it does, especially coming from a student. Thank you so much. Uh, oh my God, I can listen to you all day. <laughs> Thank you for coming hey, to talk in our class. You know, there's nothing like having, you know, missing a, a, a session that you would have loved to have attended. You know, you think, oh my goodness, you know, but the good fortune is that this is all recorded. So 